What is going on YouTube? 0088 here and it's crazy to think that we live in a reality where Shenmue 3 actually exists and is playable but does it deliver on what the fans have been waiting for after 18 years of being in limbo? Let's find out in a spoiler filled in depth review. You know, when people ask me what my favourite film is, my favourite food, or what my favourite song is, I, I'm just like that, I'm always stuck for words. <laughs> just can't decide on a single option except for one category. My favourite video game franchise of all time, and if you haven't guessed already, it is indeed Shenmue. I can't say any of the Shenmue games are my favourite on their own, but together they are the games which have inspired me, influenced me, and immersed me into their world, so much so that one of my life goals is to visit Japan and see the real life location where Ryo Hazuki, the main protagonist, lives. I still do need to visit Yokosuka. Shenmue was a game ahead of its time, it was released in 1999, a time where game characters barely had eyes and had mittens for hands, a time where the concept of open world did not exist. You could walk around a living, breathing town where everyone had a unique voice, no character model was the same, they all even had individual backstories and would have their own routines for the day. Speaking of day, it had its own day and night cycle and a combat system which was taken from what was considered the most technical and realistic fighting game at the time, Virtua Fighter. Of course, all of this today has been done and done better after 18 years you'd hope so. Done to the point where most would consider Shenmue to be outdated. Even though Sega smartly capitalised on Shenmue 3's successful Kickstarter in 2015 by re-releasing Shenmue 1 and 2 on PS4, PC and Xbox, preparing new and old fans alike for Deep Silver's and Yu Suzuki's Shenmue 3. Unfortunately though, a lot of its dated aspects have made it hard for the new fans to get into the world as I once did as a bright eyed 14 year old boy. The old janky animations, the awkward and sometimes plain bad voice acting, the stiff controls, the awkward camera angles during free battles and the fact the main character has about as much personality as a yellow HP pencil. But me personally, and I may be a little bit biased, but I think Shenmue still does some of the things it trailblazed better than a lot of modern games today. Shenmue on its own pulled me into its world with its amazing technical feats that blew my little 14 year old mind away when I first played it. But it was Shenmue 2's story, characters and action set pieces as well as its beautiful Oscar worthy score that solidified it as my favourite franchise of all time. The graphics were incomparable, the meticulous details in the gameplay, textures and world design was done with love and care. The idea that in Shenmue 1 and 2 you could go through almost any door, search almost any cupboard and chest of drawers just because it existed really immersed you into its world. Till this day Shenmue fans are still finding new things, secrets and easter eggs in Shenmue 1 and 2. The games are that dense and packed with content. The world almost feels real. These are some of its biggest appeals to me despite its dated animations and voice acting. And all of this was made possible thanks to the 70 million dollar budget creator and director Yu Suzuki had to his disposal for both games and the army of Sega AM2 developers he had behind him. Making Shenmue and Shenmue 2 the most expensive games of all time during that period. But how does the man that made Shenmue 1 and 2 with a 70 million dollar budget make a sequel of the same quality 18 years later with a quarter of the original budget? A way smaller team and no backing from Sega. Well surprisingly, a lot of what made Shenmue special is retained in Shenmue 3 by making the game not too much to modern standards but to the same standards of the time Shenmue 1 and 2 came out, making it feel like a true sequel. There were two ways Mr Suzuki could have gone, either make the graphics, animations and gameplay to the standards of games like Death Stranding, The Last of Us, Uncharted and GTA but have the game be very limited in scope or keep the janky animations and stilted voice acting, keeping true to the charm and the spirit of the original Shenmue games while allowing for room to make the game much larger and more ambitious in scope. Yu Suzuki went for the latter and I think it was the right choice but overall did that choice make the game a worthy successor of Shenmue 1 and 2? Let's get into it. First I'm going to talk about the good stuff with this game with sprinkles of bad that let the good stuff down a little. You know the little nitpicks here and there and then I'm going to talk about the bad with sprinkles of good. Bombshell. I do not consider Shenmue 3 as good as Shenmue 1 and 2 and shockingly it's not to do with the awkward janky combat that I was very worried about during development and it's not to do with the lack of features that were in Shenmue 1 and 2 such as throw moves which were omitted entirely. The missing Sega AM2 arcade games like Hang On, Afterburner and Space Harrier, the missing Sega capsule toys and not even the blasphemy of omitting the oddly satisfying drinking animation when you buy a drink from the drinks machine. You better bring this back in Shenmue 4 or I'm going to have work. 
words. It's more to do with the overall presentation and I'll get into that but let's talk about what the game did good first. Firstly, the graphics are gorgeous, Bailu Village looks beautiful, if the character models and animations are outdated, the environment surely isn't, thanks to the Unreal Engine. You can see and walk through each individual blade of grass, you can see far and wide into the mountains in the background, the temples are bursting with detail and authenticity, the environments and shops in Nauru definitely reminds me of a much bigger Wanzai from Shenmue 2. Dare I say, the environments look up to date with modern standards to me. It took me watching another review to even notice that they may have copied and pasted some areas. If that's true, they certainly hid it well because I sure as hell didn't notice. In terms of presentation, I was quite saddened to find that the menu had been completely different from the classic Shenmue games. In both Shenmue 1 and 2, you had the circular options, the beautiful menu music that just made you have this weird atmospheric feel of just when the menu music sounds this good you know the game's gonna be good but then it was replaced with something a lot more generic the music has been changed of course it's just something you gotta get used to but the menu was very basic with just a few options here that you scroll up and down with very much a far cry away from the unique options of the circular spheres that you spin around and then classic sound effects when you go through it it was just something that i noticed that made me feel like hmm this is different from the shenry i know but moving on. The game has omitted loading screens when you reach new areas for the most part unless you fast travel and then you see the classic date and time with the location loading screen. But unfortunately the game can load at strange times which can be frustrating such as stepping up Shenhua's living area. Ryo takes off his shoes and it fades to black bringing up a loading screen which is incredibly frustrating. As well as it loads sometimes when there's a cutscene transitioning to gameplay rather than it feeling seamless. I feel they could have used this opportunity to insert the nostalgic loading loading screens if they have to have these loading screens. Putting in the location and times at these points to alleviate the annoyance and distract you somewhat, at least you have something to look at then. Cutscenes are actually really well animated for such a low budget game and have kept the cinematic flair of the original Shenmue games which were ahead of their time, especially the fighting cutscenes. But what lets them down is the more casual cutscenes that feel the need to fade to black every second, but I'll go into that more in the bad section of this review. The voice acting has that classic Shenmue charm, especially from Corey Marshall who plays Ryo and seems to have not skipped a beat in the past 18 years, though a part of me feels deliberately keeping the bad but nostalgic voice acting from the previous games may have been a mistake and they should have gone for a more modern take on the voice acting, but that's my opinion. Okay. Are you sure it didn't contain any clues? <laughs> He's so awkward. <laughs> I think they actually told him to sound like that to match the old game. <laughs> yeah. Even though he's probably improved. The music is quintessential Shenmue. The Shenmue games have always had an amazing soundtrack that has stayed with me since I first played the franchise. It's definitely part of what makes the game special and Shenmue 3 stays true to this by using some old tracks as well as utilising some unused tracks from previous games. I think people agree the Bailu Village soundtrack weirdly sounds like Charlie in a Chocolate Factory. I wonder if this was an unused track from Shenmue 2's version of Bailu. The only fault I'd give the music is that it cuts out at random times and the transitions in different areas are not very smooth, but hopefully this can be fixed with a patch. And now the meat and potatoes, how is the gameplay? This surprisingly is the best part of the game, despite its budget. The game gives you relative freedom to walk around and gives you a satisfying gameplay loop of training, sparring, gambling, shopping, doing Ryo's detective work that the franchise is famous for, and they even introduce side missions, which is a welcome addition. Certain characters will ask you to run minor errands for them by triggering the exclamation icon with their square or X button if you're playing on PC. Some side missions can even lead into some action where you could end up in a fight. I only wish Ryo had more dialogue options when given side missions because once you get given the side missions, the only clue you have to go on is whatever the mission bearer gave you. And if you try asking anyone else, Ryo will default to questions that only have to do with the main story missions. Suzuki even gives you a little bit of nostalgia by getting to ride the forklifts, though it's not as like story necessary, it's more like a fun side thing, a nice little easter egg, and it's very much appreciated. In fact, the forklift part feels very 
very Shenmue like. It's like really creepy. It just literally feels like a remastered version of Shenmue 1 when you're playing the forklift bit. A lot of the old Shenmue side activities are present in 3. You can still play Lucky Hit, QTE Title 1 and 2. Although the guy's 80s action voice has been omitted for some strange reason. QTE Title 1 game 100 yen. Come on, kid! QTE title also has a new tricky mechanic that makes it much harder than Shenmue 1 and 2 as the pads can faint upwards but you're actually not supposed to punch. Oh shit! You can't play games like that! No, 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 no! This adds some intensity to the game and my muscle memory from Shenmue 1 and 2 has ruined this game for me now, but in a good way though. It makes it a lot more challenging. Even though Shenmue 3 is missing some Sega AM2 classics like Outrun Space Harrier and Afterburner and even darts in a more physical sense, it has some new games to replace them which are a bit more physical like Pale Toss with a golf and basketball variation which is surprisingly addictive and fun. Oh yes! an old timer electromagnetic car game as well as whack-a-mole and turtle races. And just to fill in that void of digital gaming that Afterburner and Space Harrier left behind, they added a spoof of virtual fighter called Chobu-chan Fighter. <laughs> I was ready to blow a fucking gasket when I thought they managed to put the virtual fighter engine in a stupid spoof game within the game, but not the actual combat system that needed it. But I was pleased to find that the gameplay was more akin to Virtual Fighter 2 rather than Virtual Fighter 3 TV 4 or 5, which would have been brilliant for the game's actual combat. Speaking of combat, this was myself and many Shenmue fans biggest worry, as Shenmue's only action oriented gameplay, apart from QTEs, is the combat. And being a deep martial arts story, the combat has to be engaging and solid. After I heard the brilliant and deep virtual fire engine was not going to be used, I got really worried. Modern day fighting systems in games such as the Batman Arkham games, Spider-Man PS4, Assassin's Creed and Sleeping Dogs all have the same simple combat system of mashing one button and having another counter button. It makes the combat look very pretty, but it's not very in-depth, which Shenmue's combat has always been. You see, those games can get very simple but pretty combat because they have other focuses such as Batman being Batman using his gadgets, stealth and even driving in his Batmobile. Sleeping Dogs is basically GTA Hong Kong and Spider-Man PS4, well, you're Spider-Man. Shenmue on the other hand needs a deep combat system since that's the focus of the game. When I first played it at the trial version I was sort of disappointed with the janky animations, how Ryo and his opponents barely react to some hits, how throwing moves and counters had been completely omitted and how Ryo was barely responsive to inputs. But then something happened. I got good. I started buying some of the more expensive skill books and it changed the whole combat system for me. Also, multiple opponent fights changed up the combat in ways I didn't expect. It became far more tactical, more so than even Shenmue 1 and 2. Shenmue 1 and 2 was more like a traditional fighting game, where you have to rely on muscle memory and pulling off counters and remembering combos and grabs. This game, however, was more about reading your opponent and waiting for the right time to unleash devastating combos and power moves. It felt more like real fighting and boxing, having to move Ryo to dodge quickly and then counter him with a flashy skill book combo. Despite the combat's jankiness, it's actually really satisfying when you knock your opponent to the ground or out the ring in the Rose Garden. The combat grew on me so much so that after finishing the game, if you were to ask me if I wanted to improve on this style of combat and add things like throw moves, counters and better smoother animations for Shenmue 4 or bring back the old virtual fighter combat, it would be actually very hard to choose what I'd prefer. I'd honestly be happy with either, hell, I'd probably miss this new combat system if they brought back the virtual fighter one. Also, you can train and spar a lot more in this game and there's an emphasis on getting stronger just like an RPG, where in the previous game the difficulty of the fight depending on how much you lost and you can only level up your moves damage rather than Ryo's endurance. I think Shemi Free's system is actually better as you feel very rewarded when you train hard and then make the guy that was giving you a Whoa. tough time earlier look like a little bitch later. <laughs> Yes! I did it! Also, just to go off on a quick tangent, there's something I'd like to call Immersive Selling of Gameplay, or ISG for short. I actually just coined that now. So, <laughs> so what does Immersive Selling of Gameplay mean? Well, the selling part comes from wrestling, where a wrestler would sell the impact of your opponent's move by reacting accordingly to make the move look powerful. Or even when one wrestler may react angry or scared to sell the other wrestler's threatening promo. How does this relate to gaming or Shenmue? Well, Shenmue and Metal Gear Solid 
two of my favourite gaming franchises of all time sold it to me that I was truly a soldier in the battlefield and I must do what I can gameplay wise to survive or that I was truly a martial artist who needs to keep his mind clear like a polished mirror and be patient to overcome a fight gameplay wise with a stronger opponent. I took the philosophies taught to Ryo and Snake by the Paragon characters in the game and applied them to myself as I was gaming and when it truly works you then feel truly immersed into that world and the world feels real. It's an almost indescribable satisfying feeling of role playing, escapism and epicness. Plan your strategy based on the enemy's positions. Try to think like the enemy commander would think. If you can put yourself in the map designer's mind, a lot of doors will open for you. When Master Miller tells you to try to think like the designer of the base to figure out where to go next, or when Zhu Ying Hong tells you to keep your mind clear like a polished mirror and fight with the philosophies of the four Wu Du, Jai, never show your moves recklessly, Gone, always practice without neglect, Dan, have clear judgement, and Yi, always do the right thing. And then you apply that to your gameplay, the results are so rewarding, this can increase the depth of a game exponentially. Even something simple like reading a move scroll from Shemu 1 that says The stab armor is a palm blow that utilizes the body's power. Take one step forward and two steps back, and then tense your limbs. The resulting impact is capable of penetrating armor, powerful enough to fell a fierce tiger in one hit. It's a different style from mine, so it's not clear. But if you remember what I read while practicing, perhaps you could master it. Iron Palm is powerful enough to take down a tiger, and you do those moves to opponents later in the game, and then you imagine that you have done that kind of damage to the characters. Oh, finishing up with that move that he learned from his dad's scroll. That was sick. Which again, immerses you even more into the combat system. This is how you sell gameplay and make the game world even more believable. And this ISG is what enhances Shemu 3's combat and training for me, regardless of how dated, limited, or rough the combat may be. The story, ah. The story of Shenmue 3. The story of Shenmue 3 picks up right where Shenmue 2 left off and you are tasked with finding what happened to Shenhua's dad. And spoilers, you don't get to find out till right at the end of the game. The story again is surprisingly and unfortunately the weakest part of the game, but I'll get into that in the bad section of the review. As for the characters, Shenhua is the standout of Shenmue 3 as you spend the most time with her and is probably the character Ryo has spoken to most of the entire Shenmue franchise. Ren is a close second, but that's not saying much as he was far more interested in Shenmue 2 than he is in 3. There are some other charming characters, but their presence in the story and the world is very short-lived. And now for the bad. Let's start with the presentation. The start screen UI is strange from the get-go by having to press R1 to get into it. Instead of for the start button, the option screen isn't particularly nice to look at and the original Shenmue 1 and 2 UI is far superior. And while the QTEs look prettier, it is annoying that they go way too fast. And even though I can forgive the lack of alternate and branch and fail scenarios that were introduced in Shenmue 2, that added a sense of realism, it does take away from the fear of failing a QTE and being forced to go through the loser's routes to your objective. That was a really cool gameplay mechanic more modern games, including Shenmue 3, need to explore, making QTEs more relevant rather than a gimmick. As I mentioned earlier, the fade in and out to black during cutscenes, sometimes even during a sentence, is very jarring and distracting and takes spades away from Shenmue's usual cinematic feel. This definitely needs to be changed in a potential sequel. Graphics wise, while the environments and objects in the game world and near modern standards. Unfortunately, the character models are very basic looking. Some characters' renders look decent, like Shenhua, Ren, Landy, and to a certain extent Ryo, while others look worse than the creator character in an old Saints Row or WWE 2K game. Even some of the important characters, like Lin's father, who's a stonemason, he has very little screen time, but the amount he is given is enough to expect his face to look better than what it does. Hopefully they improve on the character models for Shenmue 4 and make them a bit more up to date. Also, the environments are bright and beautiful, but they pop a little too much in my opinion. Making the world feel almost doll-like, where in the previous games, from Shenhua's house to Ryo's jacket, the textures gave a more lived-in and grimy look, 
whereas this game's a bit more cartoon like. For example, the moon is unrealistically large and you cannot see the moon like this from anywhere on Earth in real life. As I said before, the gameplay is quintessential Shenmue, but it is missing some things, some little nitpicks to me that are almost blasphemy, such as drinking animations at a can machine. If you the can machine. <gasps> No, 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 no! No, Rio! Come on, there's got to be the cutscene. How do you remove the cutscene? Come on, you Suzuki, man. You know we love the cutscene. It's actually kind of frustrating really because eating and drinking is a new mechanic now, and yet there's no classic drinking animation with the old burp <sighs> when it was ever present in the old games, but was absolutely useless apart from the novelty of seeing Rio drink. If forcing people to watch Rio drinking in Shenmue 3 was too much of a drag, they could have at least had an eating and drinking animation while walking like most games have today. Rio littering seems a bit out of character though. It would be hilarious if Rio said, I need to find a bed. After he finishes his drink, I can't litter. It's not right. Speaking of eating and drinking, the new stamina system that requires Ryo to eat like Goku from Dragon Ball Z can be incredibly frustrating when you have no food or money and it really makes you eat through your cash buying food, no pun intended. A separate stamina bar might have been useful here rather than your health constantly going down. I can see them patching this but I must admit it is nice to have a game where money matters rather than your main protagonist carrying around hundreds of thousands of dollars with nothing to spend it on like most games today. The combat, although janky, and stiff really grows on you as you level up and get more skill books but it is frustrating when you're in the middle of a move and the opponent gets punched or kicked and they don't react to your attack and they just punish you same with Ryo who will get punched and lose two circles of health you never know because he reacts like the crackhead kid no reaction at all this fighting system with throw moves, proper counters, responsive inputs with proper smoother accurate animations would make it possibly better than the virtual fighter engine. Another frustrating thing is certain moves from the previous games are not present here but could have easily been implemented as I've seen similar moves in the game already such as the machine gun punch, but one of the worst omissions was Zhu Ying's Demon's Triangle you learned at the end of Shenmue 2 that you didn't even get to use on anyone. It's gone in this game, not even mentioned, as well as the swallow flip, swallow kick and other story relevant moves you learned from the first two games, ruining the continuity somewhat. I beat him the swallow kick, how sick is that? Beat him with the move Master Chen taught me. One of the most annoying things is the two biggest moves you learn in this game, the body check and reverse body check are treated as QTE only story moves you can't do in free battle. And worst of all, they could have easily been implemented as concussive strikes, even if Yu Suzuki intended them to be throw moves. For example, if you did the move in free battle, the game should have forced Ryo to dodge automatically and then do the body check animation, knocking his opponent off his feet and taking a few circles of health. Seems like a huge missed opportunity and a great annoyance having the two most important and expensive moves in the game to not be used in combat. Also, for some strange reason, Ryo can't be knocked off his feet. It's not too jarring, but it seems so strange that Ryo never gets knocked down in combat. This needs to be rectified. At the Rose Guard, I never felt the fear of getting knocked out of the ring because I knew I couldn't be knocked down. It seems like Ryo really has legs and he's Asian. That's a KSI and Logan Paul reference, if you didn't know. Yeah, he has reflexes, he has legs, he has everything, and he's white. You know what I'm saying? So with that being said, he's going to be the greatest thing ever touched before. Moving on. The horse stance could have also been a lot more challenging. It's far too easy to the point of boredom. I dread doing it again in the second playthrough. Rooster stance and one inch punch are at least decent enough mini games for training, but it could be a bit better. And now for the shockingly worst part of the game. The reason most of us backed this game during the Kickstarter was for the continuation of the epic tale told in Shemi 1 and 2 about a young boy who's out to avenge his father's death but unintentionally unwraps an ancient mystery. We were presented with a lot of questions at the end of Shenmue 2 and many including me feels like Shenmue 3 did a poor job of answering those questions. Some even consider Shenmue 3 as filler. It's not just unanswered questions either, but the game's missions were repetitive, uninspired and the character development was very lacking. 
The Shenmue games are known to be slow games. In both Shenmue 1 and 2, there is an initial gameplay loop of going around and asking questions to get to the next objective, which is usually asking more questions. But eventually, you get to a point where the action begins to rise and the story begins to kick into gear. You're still going around asking questions, but it's intertwined with action set pieces, fun, entertaining QTEs, some of them that you can fail and have to find another branch to go through to get to the next part of the story, and a ton more free battles. This is especially true for Shenmue 2, where you meet a colourful cast of characters who you get to know throughout the story. You become close to a lot of them. You even feel like part of Ren's gang, the Heavens. In Shenmue 1, you deal with the Mad Angels gang of the harbour. There's a forklift job you're forced to do, but in between you're investigating and fighting members of the Mad Angels every day. At one point in the game, you play a game of chicken on a motorcycle with one of them, saving an old man who teaches you a martial arts move for your troubles. Eventually, your love interest Nozomi gets captured, and the gameplay adds something new with a motorcycle section where you have to race against the clock to save her, and of course the 70-man battle, and then finishing off the game nicely with defeating an antagonist you most likely lost to earlier, who clearly works for the man who killed your father ending in a satisfying boss fight. Shenmue 2 takes the same concept of rising action and even improves on it. You have countless fights with Ren's gang before befriending him. There's a cool moment where you have to chase him and his gang members in real time gameplay which is thrilling because if you lose them then you're forced to ask around and find them again which you really don't want to do so you really don't want to lose them. So the intensity level is high there. You come across an informant by doing secret coded signs at restaurants so you can get more information to uncover this mystery and you can get into trouble with a gang if you do the wrong signs at the wrong places. Then you have an epic QTE chase with Ren with brilliant cinematics and then you're off to Kowloon where the action is almost non-stop. You have a few encounters with the giant Don Yu, the game's main antagonist, in the creepy run-down dangerous tall buildings of Kowloon. You get handcuffed to Ren, forcing you polar opposite personalities to work together to survive Don Yu's and his effeminate boyfriend who are both trying to gain favour of Landy and the Chiyu men. You have to listen to a tape you found in a CD room in Kowloon to get information. You're forced to find, fight and defeat three of the most dangerous fighters in the walled city in order to progress the story and finally you go through one of the most epic building climbs in gaming with Ren trying to survive the yellow head building and Don Yu's men avoiding chainsaw attacks and trying to sneak past gangsters and thugs until you get to the roof but not before fighting a mysterious but powerful looking man in order to save one of your friends and then later you are forced to face Don Yu on the rooftop with your father's killer watching from a helicopter above with friends you've made along the way cheering you on and I haven't even mentioned the come down of walking through the beautiful forests and mountainsides of Shenhua after all that action. The reason why I went through all of that was to highlight the expectation here for Shenmue 3. Shenmue 3 didn't have anything even close to this. Even Shenmue 1 had some unique gameplay moments. The only gameplay change in Shenmue 3 was catching chickens and ducks, which didn't have much to do with the overall plot except for learning a move. The biggest action set pieces you had in Shenmue 3 were to fight some thugs you spend the better part of the game looking for only to get your ass kicked and then find them again and then you lose again so you need to learn a move which you do and then that move helps you to defeat the thugs and when you finally get to a new area and guess what you have to do? You literally rinse and repeat the same story again. Now compare that to Shenmue 2. Shenmue 3 didn't need to be as action packed as 2, it needed at least some character development. The masters we met that trained Ryo's father in Guilin, Ryo barely even spoke to, he never spoke about his father or Landy's father or the overall plot. We learned that an imperial envoy came to Guilin to have the phoenix and dragon mirrors carved for them and they crossed a verdant bridge or something, but again, did it really have any significance to the overall plot? Great Chai is in this game for some reason, we've already fought him twice in Shenmue 1, we knocked him into the water and if you count the omitted boat chapter, we defeated him there too if you read the boat chapter comic. And he's never seen again in Shenmue 2, so why is he in 3? And how did he get to Guilin? None of these questions are answered. We don't understand why Shenhua has this weird mysterious power that can make men talk. We just have to have our little sexual innuendo in our head figuring that out. And Ryo doesn't seem too interested or concerned by the presence of the great Chai, just to mention him again. And there's actually a chance where we could fight him, which is another missed opportunity, but instead it's just a quick QTE moment. We learn the mirrors lead to some treasure in Nauru, and that was the last place anyone had seen Shenhua's father, Mr. Yan. So we go there. Here we find out about the Red Snakes, 
we have one underwhelming QTE chase, a couple of free battles before battling and losing to Mr. Muscles, the antagonist of the game who we've only just met. We lose to him twice, and then we jump through hoops to learn a move to defeat him, just like in Bailu with the previous thugs, but then we find out Shenhua is kidnapped, and then we're forced to go to the castle where they hold up, and Neil Sun makes herself known that she was the one who kidnapped Shenhua. She was actually undercover as a pretty woman who can somehow reduce the size of her tits with magic to disguise herself. But this woman that she disguised herself as, we barely engage with. So why the disguise? Anyway, this is our first proper introduction to Neil-san, who is assumed to be the main antagonist of the game. We know nothing about her, but I'm expecting to fight her at least. But to our surprise, Landy is here. After Ryo and Ren rush through all these Chiyu men and Red Snakes in probably the only proper action set piece that's actually fun in the whole game. Unfortunately though, the immersion in this action set piece is ruined between the fighting sections because for some reason, Ren disappears and only reappears again when the enemies are spawned. Hey, where's Ren? In between all this, we have cuts to characters immediately helping to take out enemies, characters we've barely spoke to or had any interaction with, and suddenly they are helping us as if we were all best friends. These are characters most players would have only spoken to once or twice and maybe sparred with. I feel like I had a better connection with the static leaders of the two dojos in the game than with these guys. We basically had only just met. It was nothing like the emotion you have when Joy, Wong, Yandazu, who we had been looking for the whole game, and Ren, when it is watching you on a rooftop fight in Chenmu 2. This, on the other hand, felt very hollow. This is this game's version of the exciting epic yellow head building from Shenmue 2. It's not really comparable. So we get to Landy and he sends his goons on us. Finally some cool fights? Nope. It's a weak QTE section and some comedy moments with Ren. I'd rather they save some of the budget by omitting this cutscene and allowing me to fight these goons with the battle system. It would have been a lot more satisfying after that weak boss fight that wasn't even worth mentioning. Then Landy speaks. After 19 years, we hear him speak again. And what does he sound like? <laughs> it seems you've improved a bit. He sounds like a posh little boy. Gone is the menacing, venomous voice he had when he was asking for the mirror from his father in Shenmue 1. For the last time, where is the mirror? Now he sounds like an English upper-class Barney Stinson from How I Met Your Mother. You really have a death wish, don't you? Uh, then allow me to reunite you with your father. Do you remember Tao Sun Ming? Tao? That's the name of the man you killed in Moon Swan. It can't be you! Get up. I'll allow you to die like a warrior. What takes place next is the one redeeming part of the finale as well as the three battles we had earlier, and that is finally fighting Landy. Look, Landy! Why did you block all the moves? That is nothing! This is so sick! You can't land a hit on him and it's fucking epic. His movements are subtle and slick, as well as his fighting starts which is perfect. I was worried with this janky animation in the fighting system that Landy would look foolish, but he didn't. He reminded me of fighting Zuyang and Janmin in Shenmue 2, and how I couldn't land a hit on them, truly demonstrating how far behind Ryo was despite all my training. But this epic moment is cut short far too quickly. <laughs> nah man, let it be longer than that man! It even it should have been a mix of cutscene and combat, making it seamless. But if not, just make the fight longer. Make Landy do some power moves that really get your health down, but no, it's literally just a 15 second skirmish. We then see a cutscene of Ren throwing out what seems to be the fake Phoenix Mirror and Ryo and Ren escaping. And it's revealed that there is a power struggle between Neil-san and Landy as Neil-san wants to take over the Chiyu men. But this means nothing to us as we've had no insight into her character apart from the fact that she has big boobs and likes to disguise herself for no reason. Then the game ends with Mr. Yan telling us stuff we already knew, like Landy is the son of Sun Ming Zhao, Ryo's dad's best friend, and his real name is Long Shan Zhao. We had one new interest in development that Landy was taken as a child and raised by the Chi Yu men, probably the only real decent reveal. Then the game ends. The story goes on as the credits roll and my heart fills with disappointment. Disappointment only because I know how good the rest of the game was and just how many missed opportunities there were story-wise. 
All of this encapsulates what I feel about this game. Now, it sounds like I hate the game, I really don't. I think the gameplay is addictive and fun, and the world you has created with such a low budget is beautiful. But I never expected the story would suffer so greatly, the one thing we wanted. If I was to put on my tinfoil hat, I think Yu Suzuki deliberately made this game almost like a filler, because not fighting your son as the final boss seems almost unforgivable. This game feels like disc 2 of 4 discs, and the epic part is still yet to come. It feels like Yu Suzuki got a much larger budget last minute, but nowhere near enough time to truly do what he wanted to do. So he stripped some of the good stuff from the story, so he could make it much better and look better in Shenmue 4, as he has the budget and time now. That's my tinfoil hat theory of why this game's story is so bare bones, and I hope I'm close to the truth. Even if they ran out of budget for action set pieces and more cutscenes, they could have added more story fights. Maybe we could add missions taking out a few Red Snake bases in Nauru, hyping up Mr. Muscles as the final boss a bit more, allow us to get to know him. Let us have a few moments and missions with Ren, who just kind of showed up with no proper introduction. Maybe Ren, Shenhua and Ryo could have had a few missions together as a team in Nauru, add more random encounters that could lead to fights, maybe include a couple of mandatory co-op story missions for the fat martial arts master guy, Master Bay, and the broomstick chick, so we could get to know them a bit better and just have more to do and I could actually call them their actual names and know who the hell they are, rather than just running around asking questions all the time. Also, this is the most important part, very important for Shenmue 4. They need to bring back the drinking animation because that is just quintessential Shenmue, okay? Bring back the drinking from the cow machines, bring it back! This is my favourite franchise of all time. I couldn't just stay quiet, I had to get my overall feelings down and my final verdict is that Shenmue 3 feels more like a Shenmue simulator where you get to do the fun side stuff you normally do in a Shenmue game but the main story is just not there. It's just basically, it literally feels like after you've completed the game and you get to do some extra missions and some fun side stuff. There's no meat like the previous games. Gameplay wise, I gave this a 9 out of 10. But accounting for the non existent story, set pieces, and lack of character development, I'd have to drop the score to 6 out of 10 to be honest. Again, the game is wonderful, and I'm so glad after years of fighting and campaigning that we actually have it. But for the sake of the future of the franchise, I hope Shenmue 4 really improves on all this, especially story-wise. Well, that's my video. I truly hope you enjoyed it and thanks for making it this far. Please let me know what you guys think of Shenmue 3 and this review in the comments below. Like, subscribe, hit the notification bell and I'll see you again. Peace.